I think one of the things, you know, if I were to rewind five years and play things over again, uh, and it seems very, very simple. It does. It's very intuitive. But I think this one thing would go a long way for anybody starting their journey. Hi, everyone. I'm Bruno Aziza, and welcome to another great episode of Data Journeys. This is the place that we come to to learn from leaders in data and analytics, leaders who have achieved amazing results and growth, significant outcomes, and are willing to spend some time with us to share their lessons, their do's and don'ts, and their stories. And so today, I have the pleasure of talking with Mike. Mike is Vice President of Data and Analytics at Geotab. He was a CEO before of a company whose team was acquired by Geotab. He's uh, an amazing entrepreneur and has achieved very amazing things over the last five years. So we want to hear from him. Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Let's get started. What does Geotab do first? Yeah, no, pleasure being here, uh, Bruno. So uh, Geotab, we're the world's uh, largest commercial telematics provider. What that means effectively is we work with a lot of commercial fleets. So we've got a device that plugs into uh, the onboard diagnostic port of vehicles, you know, over uh, 2 million commercially connected vehicles and voted number one by ABI research across the uh, the globe. And we provide all of our customers with a number of insights, everything from safe driving to fleet optimization, better routing. And we have this wide network of partners and we've created this platform to allow our partners to help our customers to build some amazing products uh, on top of the, the ecosystem. And then from all of this data, it's my team that really looks at this data and figures how do we drive further insight for our customers from this, you know, this vast amount of data that's coming into the ecosystem on a, on a daily basis. So 2 million commercial uh, vehicles, that's 40 billion data points a day. We're talking a lot of data, a lot of changing data. So take us through the use cases that are deployed today. So, I mean, we've got a, a number of different use cases. So we've got about 40 to 50,000 customers uh, that are kicking around out there. And the problem with that is that you have so many disparate use cases, right? I've got uh, customers who are running fleets uh, of size one to over 100,000 in different verticals. Some are municipal vehicles, uh, some are vehicles uh, that do last mile delivery, uh, some are construction vehicles. So it's just such a wide array. So what we've done is we try to look at uh, what we can create broadly that will help our ecosystem uh, deliver um, more impact. And uh, one of the areas that we've done a lot of work in is predictive maintenance. Picture, you know, a, a vehicle driving around. You want to be notified if there's something wrong with that vehicle. And the instance that we looked at, we actually asked one of our largest customers, what is the biggest, single biggest problem for you? And they said, it's the electrical system. That's the biggest problem for us. And it's not the cost of a battery because batteries are super cheap in cars, but it's the cost of the downtime whilst that vehicle is on the side of the road. Right. So we looked at how can we better predict when a battery is going to fail in a vehicle to help this customer out. And, and so we did that. And after actually it was a couple of years of work, we um, developed all the pipelines that were required, uh, looked at all the feature engineering. We developed some predictive models and we actually developed predictive models uh, to clean the data uh, as well, too, because as the data is coming into the ecosystem, you look at something like a cranking voltage, which is one of the features we use to figure out whether a battery is going to fail or not. And there's noise in that data as well too. So you have to establish ML algorithms that look at bad cranking events versus good cranking events. And so the net net at the end of the day, this ended up saving this one customer millions of dollars uh, a year. And as a result, we work closely with the customer, uh, but have now started to deploy that across the entire ecosystem so that um, we can issue these, okay, we think your battery is going to fail in this vehicle. Uh, you should really check it out. And then what the customers can do and the partners can do is they can take that insight and integrate it into any other downstream maintenance applications for reminders and these kinds of things. Predictive maintenance is going to be common to a lot of folks listening to us. And, and you know, we're talking about lots of data here. I think the other dimension is you're working with a lot of real-time data, right? I think you've got about 11 petabytes of data you're working with, real-time streams going into, into your system. So what are beyond predictive maintenance? What are the other use cases you've deployed using the Google technology? I mean, they're, they're so varied and, and we've got a team, I've got a strong team. We're about 65 on the team right now doing all sorts of things. But one of the areas where I'm especially proud of this year in specific is some of the work that we did with regards to COVID. Um, and I'll explain how um, that came to play. So 
course, and everything hit in March and the world kind of stopped, we looked to ourselves and we said, how can we better help? What can we do? And we thought, you know what, we're in a position right now. And we used that kind of Johns Hopkins dashboard that showed, um, you know, how each of the countries across the world was faring when it came to uh, COVID cases. We used that as a bit of a litmus test for what we could do. And so we looked at commercial transportation recovery. And we said, you know what, with 2 million commercial vehicles across the globe, we could be a benchmark for our customers and for uh, the public sector to better understand and make informed policy decisions as it relates to recovery, not only, you know, within a country, but by sectors within a country. So how is the construction sector faring uh, versus pre-COVID? How is the oil and gas sector faring? How is a transportation logistics? Really important indicators. And and so we use a number of different Google technologies for that. The data was made available through Geotab uh, Ignition, which is our uh, open data aggregate data portal, which is fueled by Google BigQuery. And uh, these aggregates, this is what we do. We made it freely available for everyone uh, to, to access. And we created and established connectors. And one of the most interesting ones, I think, was what Deloitte did with that. So Deloitte connected up to that data set, which we updated on a daily basis, this you know high frequency data, and pulled it into their economic recovery dashboard. And within, you know, I think the first week was about 160,000 views of the dashboard. And I think what that instilled is the need to look at alternative data sources to, at a high frequency to be able to enable uh, policy and, and decision making. And, and so we started to see a lot more interest at not looking at necessarily traditional means for looking at things like economic recovery. So I think a, a really great example and the tools that we use, you know, Google BigQuery, of course, to surface the data, we're using behind the scenes, a whole whack load of other things. If you want, I mean, I can talk to some of would it make sense to talk to some of that now too, Bruno? Yeah. Well, you know, I think it, it would, because I mean, you're using data flow as well in, in, in the background. Before we go there, I mean, you have so many interesting use cases. I want to hear about the third one around the corridor analysis, which I think a lot of people that are uh, traveling uh, will, will be able to relate to. Tell us more about, about what you're doing there. Yeah, this one's exceptionally interesting too. And uh, keep in mind, our, our core customers are our fleet customers. But we believe that through the aggregate use of this data, there's a lot of assistance that we can be to uh, the public sector from an infrastructure perspective. And this one came by the way of what we did uh, with the Regional Transportation Commission in Las Vegas. And they were looking for, uh, again, this high frequency way of looking at corridor analysis and, and signal timing to uh, lessen congestion within the arteries in, in and around Las Vegas. And traditionally how it's done is there's a lot of physical manual deployments of infrastructure. And we said, we think we can do this with just data, right? So what we did is we first devised models to figure out what an intersection actually looks like. And that sounds like a trivial thing. Oh, isn't it just a point on the map, Mike? Well, no, it's a little beyond that because you have to understand the exact geometry of an intersection as it relates to vehicles traveling through there to be able to provide these metrics that we look at corridor analysis and signal timing. So we developed machine learning models that this is part of the intersection, this isn't. Oh, this was a guy that's fixing something at the intersection, a light or sitting at a parking lot that is very close to the intersection. So now, you know, uh, if I'm the traffic engineer in Vegas, I can pull up this application in near real time uh, and have a, a fantastic idea of what signal timing looks like. You can choose a whole corridor along an avenue and you get the same diagrams that a traffic engineer would be used to seeing, but on a high frequency basis in real time without any deployment, but the vehicles, you know, uh, moving around. And again, all aggregate, all privacy compliant, which is another big component of this approach. So this is precise, it's real time, it's accessible uh, by everyone. It's just, a, these are amazing use cases. And I do want to drill into the products as well as the learning. So as you're deploying these products, and here we're talking about BigQuery and Dataflow and, and a host of other technologies, what, what are the things that you've learned? Maybe the, the do's, let's start with the positive news, which is which are the things that everybody needs to go out and do when they get started on their journey? I think one of the things, you know, if I were to rewind five years and play things over again, uh, and it seems very, very simple. It does. It's very intuitive. But I think this one thing would go a long way for anybody starting their journey out is just treat data as you would any other product, right? Oftentimes, data is a byproduct of products and people look at it in that fashion. But if you don't treat data as uh, a product, you end up with issues downstream, right? So what do I mean by that? Well, I need to make sure you have proper version control, everything, the lineage, I need to understand 
the flows of from one data set to the next across my entire ecosystem. The notion of data operations as well too, right, is, is critically important. So somebody's created the data set, they leave the company, what happens to, where does that institutional knowledge go? Uh, so it's all of these things that you would think about if you were developing a product, but sometimes go by the wayside if you're thinking about data. So I think the notion of treating data as a product is absolutely essential. I mean, one of the biggest things that we've learned, and, and you know, if you're a data scientist, and you're not familiar with BigQuery, you should be, uh, because it is one of the most instrumental tools that we leverage and use at, uh, at Geotap. And traditionally, you know, you look at data science, uh, you're doing a lot of scripting in Python or R, and that's where you're doing a lot of your workloads. Look at BigQuery for doing it. it we have, a, I think, an amazing talk that's done by one of our data scientists, Daniel Lewis, and it's, uh, so it talks about uh, just do it in SQL, right? And so there's so much power that can be had by just leveraging BigQuery for these massive workloads uh, and the geospatial analysis that comes with those tools. Absolutely incredible. So don't feel like you have to do everything in Python. Let BigQuery do more for you because it can't. And then the, uh, the third thing, because this is where people will get tripped up if they go too far along a path, have a tight integration with your privacy office because Every single data product that you develop needs to be privacy compliant. And, and that isn't easy in the lens of data nowadays. There's so many different categories of data. Legislation just changing, you know, every day on a state by state level. And to understand uh, the, the implications to have a tight alignment with data and privacy is, is absolutely crucial to getting these, these products out the door. This is amazing. And you do have an amazing team. I mean, I look at the work Dan's doing. I was reading this weekend the, the work that Terrence is doing on, on publishing some of the learnings on machine learning and so forth. You really have an amazing team that, that does great work with data. Now let's talk about the flip side of that. What are some of the mistakes that people should avoid and what you've learned that you probably wouldn't do again if you were just getting started? R&D is crucially important. Like it's, it's vital to creating new innovation, new product. I think we spend a lot of time in an R&D, but we have to learn how to extract ourselves from that at some point in time and know when what you've developed is good enough. And so often I think we think, oh, you know what? I'm shooting for that, you know, 98% accuracy on that model. Well, guess what? The customer would be thrilled to have something that has 90% accuracy, depending on the product that you're releasing. And so what we found has helped is having this notion of an applied data scientist, right? So somebody who sits between product and data, who understands the data world and can talk the product world as well too, right? And says, okay, R&D team, we think that what you have there is ready to take to production. Let's put it into a pipeline and let's get going, right? Otherwise you end up burning cycles in, in too much R&D and then allow them to continue on with further refinement for sure. And then of course, I'd say, you know, there's there's an easy tendency because BQ, BigQuery is so easy to leverage and use, people just dump things into BigQuery. And it creates, uh, I wrote an article a few years back about don't create these data swamps, right? <laughs> because data lake, well, all well, good, but data swamp uh, is not something that you want. And it's easy, very easy. Oh, just push it to BQ, we'll figure it out later. No, have a consolidated approach. All comes down again to that treating data as a product. And then the last thing, before you even touch on any modeling, whether it be analytic or uh, ML based, make sure you truly understand your data and the nuances in that data. How is it collected? How does it change? If, I mean, we're dealing with IoT devices and firmware updates. What happens when firmware is updated to the data that you're collecting, right? Um, if you are in predictive maintenance, getting a deep understanding for the mechanical system behind it, right? Or the electrical system. It's fundamental to understand, you know, what happens when a vehicle is turning over and cranking so that you understand how you can construct your features to further develop your model. So then a lot of times people just jump to the model and think that the data will, and there are some amazing tools to allow you to extract insight from, from data uh, and that's being more democratized by Google as well too, but you have to fundamentally understand what the data is all about before you can continue to the modeling phase. Well, Mike, this has been amazing. I learned a ton and I wish I could continue talking to you for hours. I learned about the best practice on treating data as a product. This means think about version control, data operations, lineage. You know, don't think about data as, as a byproduct of the work that you're doing. And of course, this concept of applied data science that I hope a lot of people here will take and apply at their own company. Again, thank you so much 
for taking the time to talk to us today, Mike. And for everybody else, if you want to hear more stories just like this, make sure that you click on the link down below. Until next time, I'm Bruno Ziza.